regulators. We regulate any stealing of his property. We're damn good, too. But you can't be any geek off the street. Gotta be handy with the steel if you know what I mean. Earn your keep. Regulators! Oh, hello, Jess. Come for you. Thank you very much. That, by the way, is an exclusive for everybody that's sitting here because they are going to have to cut it out of the video. I am so sorry. I don't have the right to play that music, but I really, really wanted to. <laughs> it's fine. It's at the beginning. It's at the beginning. They can cut that out. Hi. Whew. I'm Ruth. Um, this is the part of the talk where I tell you where I'm from, what I do, who I am. I think I kind of just did that. So, hi, I'm Ruth. Um, I'm here today to talk to you about how to be a web AV artist. Yeah, I know, I know. To be honest with you, I struggled with the practicality of this talk. Um, I'm going to be talking to you about web audio API and web MIDI API. And I'm not sure how many of you are going to go back into work on Monday and put the web MIDI API into your website. Um, so I kind of thought to myself when I saw this about six months ago that I should take it literally. This is a Venn diagram. This is a Venn diagram about practical talks at conferences. And on the left-hand side, you've got what people actually talk about. And on the right-hand side, you've got what attendees want you to talk about. Um, so I made two lists, just to make sure that this is a really useful talk, by the way. I made two lists. One list is things that I have to avoid talking about. And the other list is things that I have to include in this talk. And then it will be really, really useful for all of you, and my talk anxiety will go away. So I have to avoid analytics operational excellence, chat ops, orchestration. That's fine. I think I can totally avoid these things. Um, I have to include duct tape, workarounds, bike shedding, and coffee. Easy things to include for a developer. Great. Now I've got that out of the way. Let's begin. So what is an AV artist? AV stands for audiovisual. Um, so it's an audio visual artist. It's taking some audio and making visualizations from that audio. Um, another name for this is a VJ. Um, there's not a lot of making the actual audio. We are just sort of taking what other people are making and using the data from it. Who out there remembers this? Winner. Winner. It really whips the lover's ass. Yeah, right? Oh, nice. I'm so glad. Um, for those of you that don't remember, because there are going to be a few people out there that don't remember, this is the best MP3 player of all time. Um, it's lightweight, easy, quick to install, free. Uh, but it, it actually played music that you had on your hard drive. <laughs> Amazing. But that wasn't the best thing about Winamp. No, 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 no. This was the best thing about Winamp. It had this visualization engine. So you could play your music and then whip up these visuals, and they would go in time to the music, and you could just sit and watch this for hours. Right? This is probably the most influential thing of any VJ of my generation. Uh, and this is kind of what got me into it. I was like, I want to make this. This is great. So the first thing that we need to make things like this is audio. And that's good. Uh, we have a web audio API. Um, and that gets us audio. It's great. There's four main ways you can do it with the Web Audio API. I'm sure we've come across some of these. You can create sound yourself. So you instigate an oscillator, and this creates a sound wave. And that's going to create you some sound. Uh, you can grab it from the DOM. So if you have an audio or a video element in your DOM, you can grab the, the source from that and pipe it into the Audio API. You can stream it. It's usually taking it from the camera or the microphone on your laptop and you can stream it into the Audio API. Or you can go and get a sound file and buffer the data from that sound file. So what you're doing is you're taking the data and putting it in a sort of container that the Audio API has, and then you can use that data. Um, I'm using the Fetch API in this example here to go and get my sound file. 
So a couple of examples. This one, I'm taking the sound uh, from a sound file and just piping it in, and it's analyzing that. Uh, and this one is actually picking up on my voice. So it's picking up on the microphone on my laptop, and it's streaming it into the audio API. This is my preferred method at the moment, because I don't know where I'm going to be doing my visualizations, and I don't know what sound's going to be or where the input's going to be coming from. Um, so we actually need to be able to analyze the sound. Oh, OK. I'm not allowed to say analytics. That was a, that was. <laughs> Thank you very much, Talk. Thank you. It's going gonna, it's gonna to trip me up every single time one of these things is said. But I kind of have to talk about analytics. I'm analyzing sound. Um, so to analyze sound, we can do this with the Web Audio API as well. And we do this with the Analyzer node. So we can just create one of these. And we can pipe in the sound that we have either created or got with the Audio API. Um, and then it will give us analyzed data back. And what it actually gives us is something a little bit like this which is an array of frequency velocities. For those of you who don't know what that means, frequency is sound level. So it's like low sounds to high sounds. And what we're actually scanning for here is 0 hertz, which is very, very, very low, to 20,000 hertz, so 20 kilohertz. That's very, very, very high. And we can create as many items in that array as we want. The more items, the higher resolution that we can actually detect. And the velocity value is just the volume of that frequency at any given point. And it's just a number. And then we can just use those numbers, which is exactly what's going on here. This is just a bunch of I elements, and I'm taking that data value, that velocity value, and I'm making it the height of those I elements. It's really rather straightforward, just looping over them and changing some properties. Great. We can all make visuals, and my talk is over, and we can go for an early lunch. <laughs> We can actually do some more complicated stuff. But it is relatively easy. And we're just using HTML, CSS, and JavaScript just to do something that's actually quite cool. Um, so I thought, I wonder how far we can take this with just these technologies. And I started a bunch of experiments. Now, everybody knows when you start experimenting, you need some inspiration. So this is my first inspiration. This is Bridget Riley. She's a super cool artist, said so on the slides. Um, I actually discovered her at Scotland JS last year. I went to the art gallery in Edinburgh, and she had an exhibition there. And she does these massive, massive paintings of shapes. And I was like, this is brilliant. I'm going to visualize her paintings. So I did that. So this one is just a bunch of divs. And it's all just positioned with Flexbox. And I'm just taking up more or less room depending on the data, depending on that frequency data I'm getting back. It's quite simple. And then this is another one, which is just showing and hiding some triangles based on that data. If I go quiet, they all disappear, and then they all come back. And this is just, just simply stuff in the DOM. And of course, if we're using things in the DOM, we can try and instigate some lovely CSS. Because I'm at a JavaScript conference, so I thought I should bring in some CSS. I thought that would be a really, really good idea. <laughs> Transforms are cool. Uh, with visualizations, I really feel like you could do uh, some symmetry. If I could take what's ever in the DOM and replicate it and reflect and rotate it around just with a function, then I could do that with whatever I have in the DOM. And that would be great. That would be a really cool thing to bring into a set. Um, so I did that. So I've literally just got one quarter of a screen. And then there's a function multiplying that and then just transforming it around. And that's cool. And then I thought, well, we can put anything in the DOM. And that's, that's quite good as well, because as a VJ, you kind of want to use videos and imagery. You don't just want to be making cool animations. So I thought, wouldn't it be cool if we could just drop a GIF in one of these quarters and reflect and rotate that around? And you can do that as well. This is a My Little Pony GIF, my favorite kind of GIFs. Um, <laughs> and so on and so forth. Are the lovely CSS things that we have uh, blends and filters? So the visualization that we had at the top of the show, we can just add some blend modes to that. And we've got a much nicer visualization. Well, I think the first one was pretty good. But this one has just got some blend modes on. So each element is just reflecting through to the next element. Uh, top tip for you, filters. So filters, if, if you're unaware in CSS, are things like saturation, inverting, things like that. Work on video. 
So if you are playing video clips in your set, you can invert with literally just a CSS property, which works really, really well. It's really good. Um, one CSS thing, which is actually really, really interesting, and something that was great to experiment with, custom properties. Now, we've got a lot of data, and we've got a lot of data in our JavaScript, but we might be styling with CSS. So there's almost like, well, OK, we can change styles in, in, in JavaScript. That's fine. But this is, this is an interesting one. Um, I'm sure everybody has seen this, but I am just going to go over it. Um, if you've ever used a CSS preprocessor, so SAS or less or something like that, you've probably come across uh, variables. This is almost the same idea in spec. So at the top there, we've got some CSS. You declare whatever you want, your variable, in the root element with a dash dash, and you call it whatever you want. This level that I've declared in mine is going to reflect the frequency data, which I'm getting from the an analyzer node. And then all I'm doing is changing the width and the height of the element later on in CSS. And then in the JavaScript, I can pass that frequency data back to my CSS. So I can do this with document element dot style set property. And so in real time, it can update my CSS. This is JavaScript all up in your CSS, which is odd, but can come in very, very handy. And again, can come in very, very handy for effects. Um, and so I did this. This is an example of all the things that you've just seen. We've got some DOM elements. We've got some blend modes. We've got some custom properties going on. What you might notice is it's a little bit janky. It doesn't really like operating. Oh, not allowed to talk about operational excellence. It's OK, we're halfway through the talk, 50%. Who knows which way this is going to go? <laughs> OK, I'm not allowed to talk about chat ops or orchestration. OK, OK. So yeah, this is a little bit, yeah, janky. Um, and I was thinking about performance. Um, this is my friend Ben. It's really, really good to talk to your friends. And not just for rubber duckying when you have bugs in your code, but when you're actually considering the overall thing that you're building in the best way and all that kind of stuff. It's really good to chat to him. Um, oh, chat ops. <laughs> I can avoid orchestration. I can totally avoid orchestration. It'll be fine. This will be a useful talk, I promise you. So anyway, I was talking to Ben. Um, and he was helping me with one interactive piece I was doing which is very similar to all the stuff that I'm talking to you about. Um, and we were going over performance, because it wasn't performing particularly well. And he suggested to me, maybe I should start using d3.js. Now, I don't usually use libraries until I really have to, um, but it did kind of make sense. D3 is a data visualization library. And I think a lot of people, when you say D3, think about bar charts, pie charts, that kind of thing. But it visualizes data, it does it very well. And that's exactly what I'm doing. I've got frequency data, and I want to visualize it. It's pretty good with data. It's also really good with maths. And I'm working with numbers a lot, so I'm doing a lot of maths. It's very good with the DOM, which is helpful, because that was kind of what was hindering my performance. And I can start to use SVGs very easily, which is really, really nice when it actually comes to the render. So thus begins experiments number two. This is my inspiration for experiments number two. This is called Super Graphic by Tim Leung. Um, it basically charts data from comics and graphic novels. It's a really, really lovely visual book. Um, and so stuff like this started happening. So this is a basic sunburst chart, but it's just picking up on my voice, and it's just making a nice visualization. Oh, it's coming up on all the screens. Oh, yay, that's super cool. I, I quite like screens and projectors, you might have, you might have guessed. <laughs> and things like this, which is also lovely. And there's quite a few. So we can sort of reimagine the spectrum that we saw earlier. Uh, and we can have circles instead. And that can be a nice thing to be mixing into a set when we actually get to the end and we do that. Um, this is one of my favorites, actually. It's just a nice little circle, nice little rainbow colors. Um, I want to just for a second go back to analysis. Um, and this is just before we have lunch engage brain. I'll try and make this make sense. Um, if we take this array of frequency velocities that we were talking about at the beginning of the talk, um, there is one thing about it. It goes from 0 hertz to 20,000 hertz. 20,000 hertz is very high. 
We're going to hear it, but music probably is not going to get that high. This is a keyboard or a piano. This is where it sits on that frequency scale. It only goes up to about 6,000 hertz. Now, I'm not accurately trying to visualize notes. All I'm trying to do is give the experience of a nice visualization based on music that is being played. Right? So I can use this as a guide. And I can think, actually, that kind of top part of the array, I probably don't need that. It's probably not being used in music that we listen to. The other thing to note about this array is it goes up in even steps. So each item is going to be like an even step of the last one. That's not how notes work. So this is a keyboard. I've highlighted some keys A on a keyboard. Keys are denoted in letters A to G. Um, and they start again, so an A and an A are octaves apart. And we say octave because there's eight notes in between. There's 12 semitones. And the two A's sound very, very harmonious if you play them together, even though one's lower and one's higher. So this middle key here, this orange key, this is A. This runs at 440 hertz. The one below it, the purple A, runs at 220 hertz. That's a 220 hertz gap. The one above it, however, the green one, runs at 880 hertz. So that's a 440 hertz gap. So the gaps are actually doubling. They're not equal. They're doubling. So to get a better analysis from the data that we have from the audio API, we kind of want to do something like this. I'm going to slice the array. Kind of don't need that data. There's no point in me having it. And then I need to spread it out. Yeah. So magic function. Too close to lunch, won't go through it, is on the internet. I wrote an article about it. It is basically doing that, slicing the array. We're doing some averaging. We're pushing all this new data back into the array. Someone's taking a photo. I'm just going to do it. I've got seven and a half minutes left. Um, and I've got a couple of examples for you. So this is, let me just, there we go. This is a visualization before I do anything on the data. And you can see it's quite heavy towards the right. So this is where the analyzation starts, is on the right. Okay. Um, afterwards, after we've run the function, we get something a little bit like this, which is much more spread out and I think works as a better visualization. And also, it's going to be good if I want to do anything like low, mid, or high frequency detection. Because I can do it on data that actually represents the music that's playing, not the data that we're getting back from the audio API. So we have visualizations. That's the crux of it. You can all go away and make visualizations now. That's great. Um, I did Codevember last November with all these experiments in. They're not the final versions that I really use, but it was really good to experiment. So you can go on um, CodePen and have a look. Um, one last thing, checking my time here. How do I control these visuals? That's important. I'm going to be playing sets. And you're probably going to be playing sets of DJs and musicians, and they're going to be c controlling stuff with lots of you know, decks and things like that. So you don't really want to be sitting here pressing your keyboard. You can control visuals with your keyboard. That's absolutely perfectly fine. But you kind of want something a little bit cooler. I tried the GamePad API. Um, but the GamePad, it's kind of a little bit funky. And there's not enough control with the GamePad. So I settled on this, this MIDI API. Um, MIDI is a data protocol. I know when I say MIDI that people think of 80s bleepy music. It's not. It's a data protocol for instruments to talk to each other. So it came around about 1983, and some in industry experts and mu music manufacturers got together because there was a rise of electronic, in electronic instruments in the 70s. And they thought, wouldn't it be nice if all these instruments could talk to each other? They're electronic. They could probably send data to each other. Um, and so they did, and they came up with the spec MIDI. This is a MIDI instrument. The big difference between a MIDI instrument and what I'm just about to show you is this has onboard audio. This is a keyboard. You've probably seen them. You've probably played them. I can plug this into my computer, and it will send my computer MIDI data. But it also plays audio standalone. It can also talk to all the other instruments and kind of orchestrate with those. Oh. <laughs> we are so close to the end of the talk as well. <laughs> Useless talk. Never mind. Never mind. Ha, ha. Uh, MIDI instrument. 
Uh, the big difference between this and what you're probably more likely to see and want to use, which is this, is this is a MIDI controller. This doesn't have any onboard audio, but it's still sending MIDI data. So if you plug this into your computer and run some code like this, which is the web MIDI API, you can pick up on the data it's sending, which again is just numbers. And that's really cool. Um, there's lots and lots of different MIDI controllers out there. Um, and if you search for them, uh, you, it'll come up with loads of them. And I recommend buying them and trying out that code because it's really fun. This is my MIDI controller. This is a Minim. This is my little one carrying around in my handbag. Uh, this is actually running via Bluetooth to my machine. Usually, you'd find uh, MIDI instruments and controllers running via USB. They used to run via DIN, which was an old, fat, round cable, which I'm sure some of you remember. Um, and I can use this to control my visuals. So hopefully, if demos are, demo gods are being kind to me, I can use this to mix. It's working in here, but not in there. Hang on. Let's see if that one will. <laughs> no, it's not happy today. Um, I can use this to mix my visuals and change them. So I can attach all the different things that I made onto the different buttons, um, and then choose which ones come up at different times. And then I can mix from one into the other, which is great. Whew. Is any of this real? Kind of seems silly, doesn't it? Like, I'm making crazy visuals in a browser, controlling them with little boxes of light pads. This is me. Um, I have a little pocket projector. So I put my laptop and my MIDI controller and I, my pocket projector in a bag, and I kind of hacked the bag so that you can unzip it and have the projector out the bottom and carry it around like an usherette tray. So you can actually play music and project onto things as you carry it around. And this is me projecting onto the streets of my local city. And I did this. I made this thing. This is running the software which I wrote, um, all in a browser. And some people started talking to me on the internet. The internet's are good. And things like this happened. So there's a whole bunch of us doing similar things, taking web technologies and building things with it. They build music software with JavaScript. They control lights with JavaScript. I don't know whether you saw nested loops at the beginning of this, of today. One of the guys, Martin, is controlling all the lights via DMX with JavaScript. Um, Livejs.network, if you want to look us up. We have a stand. Uh, by the community area, where we have lots and lots of MIDI controllers, and we have all of this stuff going on. All the music that you hear between the breaks, that's us. And stuff like this happens on the internet. I mean, we've got a GitHub organization. Got to be real. If you've got a GitHub organization, right? That's like badge of reality right there. And we all play gigs. Like, not just together and not at conferences. Like, we actually play gigs, which is crazy. So you do my day job, you can go and play a gig. Madness. I got to play a festival over the summer. OK, there is one thing that I really, really want to address before I go. That's this. See, I, I don't think that uh, my talk really picked up on what was really going on. And I'm sure you guys did. Right? The keen eyed among you will realize uh, sound? No? Nope. OK. Uh, <laughs> there is duct tape holding the portable VJ kit together. Of course there is. Duct tape holding everything together. Ben is on a bike. Yes. <laughs> Still more sound. <laughs> this whole function is a workaround. Yeah. And drinking coffee. I know. <laughs> Thank you very, very much. All the music that you heard us by Kanoa, I, I recommend you. Look her up on SoundCloud. I'm Ruth John. You can find me on the internet. Come and talk to me over there. <laughs>